Hello everyone. So, many of you will know that light has a strong wave-like character, especially when you look on the microscopic scale. But it's not often that you actually see light waves move almost like the waves that move over the surface of a liquid. So here in these images you can observe the evolution of light waves after they've passed the apertures of a so-called photon sieve. Now what photon sieves are and how they're made is the main subject of this video. And in addition I will also show you how I generated these images. The idea for this video was actually born a few months ago when a viewer named Michael Miller left me a comment. Now, at the time I had never heard of photon sieves, but the name sort of stuck and made me curious. The name photon sieve is a bit misleading. They are actually not sieving anything, they just look like sieves. And in essence a photon sieve is just a plate with a large number of tiny holes in it. The size of these apertures is of the same order of magnitude as the wavelength of light. And that is why light is actually not passing through them in a straight line, but is diffracted in various directions. And in addition, the holes are not placed randomly, but each hole is exactly in the right location, so that it can work together with other apertures to create, for example, a focal point. And in this way, they can collectively act as a lens. Now, I must admit that, at first glance, I was not particularly impressed, since many of the sieves looked a lot like the Fresnel zone plates that I had made previously. But as it turns out, photon sieves have a few advantages over zone plates. Due to their irregular patterns, they can largely suppress the higher order focal points, which are quite strong in Fresnel zone plates. And at the same time, they can also create a sharper image by tweaking of the exact positions of the apertures. But for this to work well, you need quite a lot of them. During my internet search, I found a few exciting applications of photon sieves, like for example this one. Now, by adding color filters to the tiny holes, like the color filters you find for example in LCD screens, you can effectively make achromatic lenses. So generally, diffractive optics has a major disadvantage, which is um, the large chromatic dispersion. And this is an intrinsic weakness when you use diffraction. But there's actually a way around this. In this example you see three patterns, which are individually designed for a specific color. And their whole patterns are designed in such a way that they all have the same focal distance for the transmitted wavelength range. So these patterns look very similar, but they're actually complementary. So they can be merged together to form one achromatic lens. So how does a photon sieve work? Well, let me start by saying that it's actually not the holes themselves that diffract the light, but the edges of the holes. So the bigger the hole, the smaller the relative amount of diffraction and the average angle of diffraction. And this is also why in all photon sieves, the holes get smaller going from the center to the outsides of the sieve. But let's for a moment assume that each hole acts as one diffractive point source. And let's say your desired focal point is here. So what you can do is choose the position of each hole such that the distance between the focal point and the hole is an integer number of wavelengths. So the wavefronts originating from each hole will arrive in phase at the focal point. In other words, at this specific point, the intensities of all the waves will add up and will locally create a relatively high intensity. And in other points, the light intensity will actually more or less average out, because some waves might be out of phase with the waves originating from other holes. Now my plan was just to make photon sieves and find out hands-on what they're all about. Now as a basis I used old photolithography masks. And these are actually quartz plates that have a chromium layer on top which is non-transmissive. So to make the photon sieves I just had to etch tiny holes in the chromium layer. And here's the process. So I spin coated a layer of photoresist on top of the chromium layer. Then exposed the photoresist in the photon sieve pattern developed it, etched the chromium and then stripped away the photoresist, leaving the mask with the photon sieve pattern etched in it. So most of the process was performed here. 
To the right a simple microscope to monitor the etching process. Behind it is the spin coater for applying the photoresist. And to the left is a hot plate to bake the photoresist at 90 degrees Celsius after spin coating. The exposures of the sieve patterns were performed using a home-built maskless wafer stepper. And in the past I've made a few videos about this project. So one of the most powerful features of a maskless wafer stepper is that you can make any desired pattern in the photoresist basically right away. So instead of having to choose for one particular photon sieve pattern, I decided that it would be a nice idea to start with the simplest sieve possible and then increase the complexity of the sieves and see how the diffraction patterns evolve with the increasing complexity. So here's an overview of the patterns for the different sieves I made. I started out with a pattern consisting of just two holes, then increased to 4, 8, 26 and so on, until I finally reached the full photon sieve pattern which contains around a thousand holes. By the way, this is what the sieves look like in reality etched in the chromium. And as you can see even the largest one is pretty small. And to see the individual holes you have to put the sieves under a microscope. To study the diffraction patterns the sieves were placed under a microscope and then illuminated from the bottom side using the monochromatic light of a helium neon laser. From the top we can observe the light as it passes through the holes. But in addition we can also study the diffraction patterns that are generated by increasing the height of the focal plane of the microscope. So this is possible because the microscope objective only has a very limited focal depth, which is in this case less than a micron. So we can use this effect to study the shape of the wavefront as it develops in space, because we can selectively look at a specific layer of the wavefront. And you actually don't need a fancy microscope to do this. I used one from a second hand store which I bought for around 80 euros. Now in addition I used a PC with a camera attached and this almost antique helium neon laser from 1979. And of course I used the photon sieve that I made previously. So let's quickly compare the different sieves and diffraction patterns that they generate under a microscope starting out with the one containing only two holes. So here you see the holes in focus and if we move the focal plane of the microscope upwards we observe the diffraction pattern caused by the two holes. Basically we just have two sources so you can observe sort of a focal line or plane in between the two holes. Anyway let's quickly move through the different sieves. So here's the pattern with 26 holes, so more than three times as much as the previous sieve. And here's the diffraction pattern. Now as you can see there's actually a big improvement in the definition and the brightness of the focal point compared to the surrounding area. Still 26 holes is actually a very limited number, so let's add a few more. And here we are at 350 holes. So as you can see the intensity of the focal point actually gets a bit too high for the sensor and the pixels saturate. So if we decrease the sensitivity of the detector we see that the intensity of the focal point is indeed much higher than the surrounding area. Now the last image is that of the full photon sieve pattern. So let's look in a little more detail at what happens near the bigger holes that are closest to the center of the pattern. Now, as I said earlier it's the edge of the hole that actually diffracts the light and in these bigger holes you can see how the edge creates interference patterns that are much smaller than the hole itself. And this same phenomenon is actually not observed in the outskirts of the pattern where the holes are much smaller and act as point sources. And this is also the reason that the small holes get out of focus very quickly because the light is diffracted under a very wide angle. 
At the beginning of this video, I showed you this clip where you could see how the light waves evolve after they left the apertures in the sieve surface and then move towards the focal point. So the distance between the sieve surface and the focal point is about one millimeter. But we should realize that we're actually looking at photons that are moving with the speed of light. And it takes them a mere 3.3 picoseconds to cover this distance. So since distance covered and travel time are linear in this case, we can also look at these images in a somewhat different way. Basically, the focal plane is traveling along the path of the photons. And so the images also represent a time resolved record of the development of the light waves. And now you see how light is behaving very much similar to the waves on a surface of a liquid.